Okay, perhaps it is time to begin. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to all those who have not yet attended our seminar. We began yesterday and we are continuing today. It is such a great privilege to have Professor Sonia Livingstone from LSE London uh, to join us, uh, to think, go through, and uh, understand how the world is changing for children, for youth, and what it means in terms of their learning, well-being in the digital world. Sonia has intensively engaged in research, but also providing insights for policy and practice through her work and all the networks and projects that she has engaged over the several years. Also your work for the EU on EU Kids Online have been pivotal in inspiring our work as researchers. And particularly what I personally appreciate is the fact that your work really has engaged not only us academics in thinking about the digital futures of our children, uh, but also your work has greatly impacted policy and practice. I think that is something very, very important. And so thank you, Sonia, for being here today, uh, sharing your work as part of our Nordic Research Network on digitalizing childhoods. I think your, your work is very pivotal to us and we look forward to learning more about your recent thinking and ideas. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Thank you Christina. Thank you. I should take this, I think. Oh no, I don't. No, no, no. no, no. I have one. Sorry. Christina, thank you so much. Um, it is a pleasure and a privilege to be here. And um, I'm delighted to have this chance to tell you something about the research that I'm doing uh, in a project called Parenting for a Digital Future. So I'm, I think I'm standing in a room with many people from the field of education, though I'm sure also from other fields. So I will introduce myself in this context as a psychologist, a social psychologist. And I've worked for many years in the field of media and communication, which is an interdisciplinary meeting point of many ologies and other, other fields. Uh, and I was intrigued listening in the previous session to the kinds of questions that you ask thinking very much about learning. Uh, and the work I'll talk about is part of a network called Connected Learning. Uh, the Connected Learning Research Network, which has been led over the last few years by Mimi Ito at the University of um, Irvine, California, and funded, the work has been funded by the MacArthur Foundation in the, in the States. And I'll say a little about that, that framing, uh, and then how I, as a, psych a social psychologist, came to be uh, in this, in this um, uh, education-funded project. I mean, the project, uh, for those who don't know, is really uh, trying to understand how we can, as a society, connect the different sites of children's learning, especially um, their home, the um, school, and then the various kind of non-formal learning settings. And a lot of the MacArthur Foundation work and a lot of the Connected Learning Research Network has been focused in the non-formal settings. And there is within those non within that work uh, critique, sometimes more or less explicit, of school. But I felt coming into the network that there is also sometimes a silence about the home. And as a social psychologist, I really wanted to bring in the home as a learning site. And I especially in this project wanted to think about the role of parents and parents as um, uh, informal educators as mediators of their children's uh, learning, sometimes as problems for their children, uh, parents of all kinds. And so the work that I've done that I'll tell you about today um, was done with Alicia Blumross and we um, 
really tried to bring in the parent, not just, if you like, as a helping hand to their child, but the parent as a whole person. The parent with their own perspective, to think also about the voice of the parent, which is um, not always um, heard, as I, shall, as I shall make clear. But I want to, so the, so the work I'll be talking about has been a project, I'll tell you a little of the methodology. Um, and it's coming out as a book uh, in the spring with the same title, Parenting for a Digital Future. Uh, and I'm going to start in the middle of the book. <laughs> so I wanted to start with the idea of geeks. <laughs> Why? Geeky, geeky families, families who have chosen, if you like, voted with their feet for a digital future. And I'll start with them, and then I'm going to kind of pan back to the broader mix of families who are engaging in the digital world. So here is a conversation that I had with um, Danny, who is the, um, the, the non-custodial parent, the separated parent of Josh, who is 12. And Danny works in computer sales. And we sat in a cafe uh, after Josh had been at a rather expensive uh, digital summer camp to learn coding and Danny and Josh had such a lively conversation I barely got a word in edgeways and Danny was very keen to tell me all about her recent qualification in ethical hacking and her identity as a geek and her kind of love for all things digital so here you can see she's beginning with the, the scandal about Ashley Madison, which perhaps everyone knows. No, um, Ashley Madison was a, set up a website for married people who wanted to find a sexual partner, and then all the data was hacked. So <laughs> it was an interesting moment. Um, and there was a lot of publicity, and I think it made many people very aware of the uh, sensitivity of the data that is being collected about them. It was a good moment in digital literacy, I think. Um, and Danny, having recently gained this qualification in ethical hacking, kind of went behind, and she became fascinated by the, you know, the company said it's okay, we have deleted all the data, and she said there is no such thing as delete, and she kind of went, and she joined with all the other um, geeks online, and they had a whole, anyway, she's telling us about this. And she's involving her son in this conversation. And her son, um, as you can say, Josh says, yeah, you, you know, when you see the geeks get together and they have a really massive argument about it, you know, she wants, he, he kind of wants to understand, and Danny says, yes, I understand them, I'm one of them, don't worry. And I, this is an argument that I, uh, I've been having um, with Mimi Ito about whether people kind of self-identify as geeks, are geeks a category in the world? And um, I say, I'm wondering whether to call you geeks, you know, and Danny says, yes, absolutely, I'm happy to be a geek, there's nothing wrong with it. And I kind of wanted to begin with that moment because um, there's a lot of talk about parents in a digital world and very often they're talked about as digital immigrants, though we know this is changing. But here is somebody who is um, so much the opposite of a digital immigrant. And it raises, I think, some really interesting questions about how then does Danny parent? What, what, what does she think of as her role? And her, her strategy to parenting is precisely to embrace the identity of a geek and devote her life to ensuring that her 12-year-old son um, lives in that world. So Danny, if you like, has a vision of the digital future and she wants to make it now. So here's more things from Danny. You can um, read them or not, but she... It's not just that she believes the future is digital and that therefore it's her responsibility as a parent to make this happen, but she also has a theory of learning. So her theory of learning is that Java is the new Latin. Actually, we heard this from quite a lot of parents um, in the sense that A, it, coding is now fundamental, and secondly, that coding is the transferable skill. Once you've learned Java, you can learn almost anything else, just as when you learn Latin, you could then learn Spanish or French or whatever. 
And she embodies the theory of connected learning, which, which we were all working with too. So the second quote from her, she talks about the collaborative nature of learning coding, the social nature. So she describes the scene when Josh is there with his tablet playing Minecraft and he invites his friends around and they connect up and they all play together. And she um, sets them coding tasks and they kind of all, and, and loves watching them kind of doing the problem solving together. Uh, and again, she makes the analogy with the, the previous world, this time with Lego. So the kids used to build things with Lego, that was the collaborative play. Today they do it with Minecraft, this was a few years ago. Um, but the principle is the same. And then she gives me the big theory, you know, I'm excited about the digital future. It's not just learning, it's work. The world is changing, the workplace is changing. How I prepare my child for that um, place is, is, is changing. You know, we're going to move to a world in which you might say to someone, what, you don't know Java? You know, how embarrassing, how could you have admitted this? So, a bit more of the conversation between Danny and Josh. So this was a moment, as you can see, where Danny and Josh kind of took over the conversation. Um, and I think I had asked something like, um, uh, Josh, how did, you, how did you get into this? How did you become a geek? And Danny um, scaffolds the conversation. So she begins, <laughs> she answered a lot of questions, um, and says, you just, it, you just got into it, right? And Josh says, well, I got into the Xbox. That's my main thing, okay. And you said, I, if I have to go in at lunchtime, go and code, go and program. Okay, so he's done what many boys do. He gets an Xbox, he thinks it's fun. Danny says, go and learn coding. If you're gonna get into this, do it properly. And then, you know, they have a conversation um, and the whole conversation is about how she has scaffolded and structured and kind of encouraged his learning. Why don't you do this? Why don't you have a little play? Oh, you've done that, yes. And then she installs the um, necessary software on the machine at home and he discovers it's not fast enough and she installs it on a different machine um, and so forth. And he says it's fun. Okay, I'm having fun. And she reminds him, yes, but you're creating something. You're learning something. Um, and then she gives him the kind of the punchline, the takeaway. You do realize that's what people do when they make a game, right? That's the, she gives him the kind of the critical literacy message. This is how it's done. This is how it's made. You think you're having fun, but actually you're learning a vital skill for the future. He has the, he gets the, the meta message. So she's very, um, she's very motivated to do a lot of work and I, and I kind of want to, to open up the question about what kind of work are parents doing at home um, when they scaffold and structure the learning opportunities for their children because I think often we think the child is in the classroom, we don't ask too much about where they came from, what they learned at home, what is the role of the parents. I saw this very much in the, in the digital uh, coding summer camp that Josh was in, that the children arrived on day one, the um, educators assumed they knew nothing, they taught them everything within the class, and then um, after, I think this was a, a, a two-week camp or a three-week camp, off they went, and the educators don't ask questions, you know, where are they going, what, 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 what are parents doing between day one and day two? How are children explaining to the parent what it is that they learned? Um, so I was kind of on, thinking on the side of the parent, the invisible parent, and I stood with them at that moment of drop-off where, you know, it, uh, and it was crazy, all the, all the parents and kids were arriving and the teachers were harassed and they wanted to start the class on time. And there was a, you know, such a rush of people and no moment really for the parent and the teacher, parent and the educator to have a conversation. And that moment was not created. And the only moment that was created, and it was very expensive uh, uh, summer camp, was at the end when there was the showcase. And the parent would be the audience and the children and the educators would show. But the parent never gets much voice. 
And, I, and, and, and yet, you know, when I sat down with Danny in a cafe, she had a lot to say. And so, in fact, did Josh. So just to kind of focus on my... Actually, I'll, I'll, I'll begin on the, on the left side. So I really wanted to, to th us to think about parents in an in a, um, educational frame, um, going beyond the idea of digital natives and digital immigrants, and think about the kind of practices that are emerging. And here I'm uh, inspired by the work of Bridget Barron, who talks about um, mentoring and brokering uh, on the part of, of parents and scaffolding. And so the project is really to try to kind of explore what, what expertise do parents have, how do they make use of it, um, what kind of pleasures do they find in it, if any. And in our project, we had a number of these geeky families. And what's interesting about the geeky families is you know, there's always been geeky families. There's always been um, parents who shared stamp collecting with their child or train spotting with their child or whatever it is. There's always been the geeks. Um, but the geeks have not, the geeky families have not always felt they are in the mainstream. They are doing the thing that is of the moment that is now valued by the future employer, by the government investing in technology. They've been a bit kind of weird and sidelined and suddenly they, they have that potential to be mainstream. So they have a confidence. Um, and something that was subcultural has become more um, in, the, in the center. And that idea of a subculture is also interesting because we think of subcultures as kind of alternative. But a lot of the language of coding, a lot of the discourse of coding is, is, is much more neoliberal, is much more about the skills you each need as an individual child to get ahead in a competitive future. You'd better kind of get those skills. So what I want to convey with the story of Danny and Josh is the effort and the investment that Danny is putting in. Um, it's a demanding strategy. It takes a lot of resources. It takes a lot of time. Um, and it takes a real identity commitment. So Danny, as I said, she's the, um, the non-custodial parent. She doesn't have a lot of money. She works in sales, which is a kind of lower middle income kind of position, so it's not that she's wealthy. She's worked very hard to raise the money to send her son to this expensive summer camp. Um, but she's remade her house with um, a lot of computers and a, you know, her own network and, and, and so forth. So my last point is about the uncertainty. And when we interviewed parents about the digital, and especially the digital future, uncertainty and ambivalence are the dominant kinds of emotions. So now I turn a little to um, what Josh himself said. Um, and he says several things which give you a sense of what it means for him to be uh, encouraged, brought up as a geek, to be encouraged to embrace this, this world of a digital future. So first of all, he's kind of, proud. Um, yeah, the kids in my class, they've heard of Java, they know, they don't know, no, they don't really know. I know. Okay, I, I have that kind of superior status. But then he sort of gives it away a little bit. He also says, yeah, but the other kids, they're so cool. They've got all the friends. They're into the sports. They're accepted in the... In the I'm, I'm the kind of, you know, by implication, it doesn't say explicitly, but by implication, I don't fit in. And so it is, um, and we saw this in our research, it is sometimes the kids who don't fit in who have found this new pathway through the digital, and perhaps also by finding that new pathway, even though they feel in the vanguard of um, government discourse, powerful discourse, they still don't fit in. Because the more he learns, the more a part he is. And so there are some costs to this identity commitment that the family has made. And the uncertainty is that they don't know, you know, is he learning anything of value? Will coding be getting the income, the security of the future? We don't know. So I didn't learn, I learned a little bit about the school life, um, Josh's school life from the interview, though I didn't go to the school, but I heard um, 
you know, and we get a sense of how he's a bit on the outside, but he also later in the interview said a lot about how ahead he was. And for Danny and for Josh, this was a problem. He's way ahead in all the kind of technical classes, but he's still struggling in some of the others. He's also a normal kid. In the, in the non-formal learning site, in the, um, uh, in the digital summer camp, he was uh, very quiet, just sat there staring at his screen, didn't really say very much, was not that chatty boy that I saw with his um, mum later in the cafe, who was fulsome and had lots to say about, I am a geek. Um, so does learning connect across the sites? Actually, you know, I use this family also as an example of how difficult it is to connect the learning across the sites. His knowledge at home is of value. His knowledge in the summer camp is respected and validated, but he's still very quiet. And his knowledge at school makes him a bit of a problem because he stands out and he's ahead. And it hasn't, so there are some disconnects and the disconnects are something that the family is also struggling a bit with. So this is the model, the plan for the book. Uh, and as you can see, I began in the middle with the geek identities and um, parenting for a digital future. So we've subtitled it, How Hopes and Fears About Technology Shape Children's Lives. And the subtitle is to say, we really believe that what parents hope and fear is um, significant in shaping children's lives. But what we argue is that their hopes and fears are future directed. And the future, of course, is hugely unknown. And therefore, in the present, the way in which their hopes and fears shape their children's lives is surrounded by a sense of risk and anxiety. Um, and as I said, the book will come out in the spring. So we ask these questions. We ask kind of questions on four layers, really. So one is the very uh, straightforward, descriptive question. How are families bringing up their children in the digital age? What are they doing, these families, these parents? Um, let's not assume they're all the digital immigrants, so let's try to discover. But we also ask what is expected of parents, and a lot is expected of parents. I'll say a little about that um, soon. Um, because parents are, live in a, a world of discourse, and that discourse about parents and uh, giving injunctions to parents to tell them what to do is often very problematic for them. Then we particularly kind of focus on their imagination of that future. Uh, and our argument there is that if you ask parents about the future, they think in terms of science fiction. You know, who, who can imagine the world in 2040? Today's children will be grown up in 2030 or 2040. Describe that world. What does a day in the life look like? Everyone turns to technology. You know, oh yes, the robot will make me a cup of tea, whatever it is. You know, we, we think tech when we think about the future. What does that mean when you're trying to bring up a child who will be an adult in that future? It means that you think the tech is going to be important and you start investing and so on, if you can. And then our last question, which is in a way the connected learning question, is how does the actions of parents relate to the other socializing agents? So the child is subject to what the parents do, what the teachers do, what the community does, what other agents also do, what their peers do, what they themselves think. So where does parenting fit into that larger story? And Danny was one, Danny and Josh were one of the 73 families that Alicia and I interviewed in and around the London um, area. We uh, sampled families for diversity and we had a bias towards those who have um, voted for their feet for the digital. So we especially tried to recruit around um, digital media learning sites, uh, after school coding clubs, uh, but then we also kind of looked more broadly to families who were not especially interested. And we um, observed in those learning sites and interviewed um, always the parent and the child whenever we could. A any parents. Parent, of course, means parent stroke carer stroke whoever has responsibility for the child. And then... Uh, 
after doing this ethnographic work, we started to get a lot of questions about why London, what does London represent, isn't that peculiar? So we said, okay, we'll do a national survey, and we took many of the insights from the field work, and we designed a survey questionnaire, and so we interviewed um, uh, 2,000 British parents. You will tell me afterwards uh, how much this is, relates to Finnish parents and Swedish parents. And whatever else, I can't, I don't speak for them. So I'm trying to kind of both go very micro and also quite, um, quite broad. Uh, so I'll just give you one um, uh, graph from the survey which is just to kind of put people like Danny and Josh into context. And we asked in the survey, one of the questions was a very simple question, which is, here's a list of activities, which of these did you do with your child in the last week? And they are arranged in rank order, and to the panickers in the media, the journalists who say, families are dead, everyone is staring at a screen, nobody talks to each other anymore. You see that actually they do quite a lot together and actually families do still eat meals together and they still engage with old media, <laughs> television and films together. Um, and there are lots of different things they do. And people like Danny and Josh who use technologies in more creative ways, actually they're still um, a minority. Of course, they're a minority, lest we think everyone is very techy. Um, and old-fashioned creative activities seem even more popular. But also, actually, these surveys are becoming impossible. You know, maybe these people are shopping together on Amazon, on their tablet in the home. Maybe they are playing games together on a computer, on a console. Maybe even their creative activities of making music together are digital. You know, actually... We don't, it's very hard to ask questions anymore. We could ask many more, of course. Um, but the point for me is that the digital is already in many ways embedded in family life, and family life is itself uh, the dominant uh, framework within which children are socialized. Um, so we really need to kind of grasp the nature of those uh, domestic interactions in order to understand both why families come to using technologies in particular ways, uh, and also, what are all the other things going on in the family life? And uh, this paints perhaps a, little, a rather happy picture, but we also had, um, in many ways, quite um, uh, families facing lots of difficulties, many families struggling. So we also heard from Danny, for example, about the fact that their parents were now separated and the children were moving between homes, and the, this was difficult in some ways. And of course, you know, every family has has a series of struggles. And these struggles that families are facing shape the way in which the children come to their learning and the way in which they see the potential or the problems of digital technology. Technology, um, as I said, it kind of crystallizes those hopes and fears of families. And so it makes, uh, they invest in it often because of the difficulties they're facing. Perhaps they've got a lot of difficulties, but the technology will provide a solution. And then the, the technology brings a whole new set of uncertainties, and that um, adds to the family anxieties. So in the larger scene, families are facing, um, uh, I said, you know, what, are, what, what is expected of parents? And two very contradictory things are being expected of parents. Many things are expected of parents, of course. But the first thing that we hear a lot in Britain, perhaps also in your countries, you, you'll tell me later, um, the world of work is changing. All the jobs that children, that people do now will not exist when your child grows up and the jobs will be taken over by the robots. You better get your kid coding, okay? Number one, get your kids using tech. And the second discourse, which is also very strong, is don't let your children touch the tech, right? Screen time is bad, technology is bad, everything else is much better for your child. Keep them away from the mobile, keep them away from the computer. Parents are being told these two things forcibly, constantly, and without seeming um, 
negotiation between these two messages. And so parents are, so everything to do with technology is ambivalent. They buy it because they think their child will be left behind if they don't. And then when their child starts to use it, they look at their watch, how long have they been on, is this harming them? You know, I, I, I don't know why we can't straighten out our story about um, uh, what parents are meant to be doing, but it's very contradictory. So what you can see in the survey um, is that parents, roughly half of parents say, we're trying to be ahead with the technology. And roughly half of parents say, we're trying to resist the technology. And these halves overlap. So if you imagine a two by two, we have you know, families trying to do both and families. Um, the way we think about it in the, in the book is that we say some families are really embracing technology, like Danny, and some are really resisting. But most of them are trying to navigate some kind of balance. And that balance is not um, an easy one that you just achieve and you leave it alone. It's one that you work at every day. You worry every day, am I getting the balance right? Um, should I do a bit more of this, a bit more of that? I'm also interested in, in what implicit role uh, these discourses create for parents. So the screen time discourse, which um, uh, runs through all of our interviews, we heard it from so many families about screen time, and the, particularly the rules set some years ago by the American Academy of Pediatrics, which said no more than two hours for your children unless they're under two, in which case no time at all. Most British parents have not heard of the American Academy of Pediatrics, but they've heard of two hours. And they told us two hours over and over again. Um, and what it does is it tells them that they are the police. And they talk in the language of policing. I have to police my child. I have to monitor my child. I have to punish my child when they use it too long. It's that language of surveillance and punishment and, and, and policing. And this is not the role the families want, because families are, as Anthony Giddens says, living, uh, you know, trying to kind of create a new democratic family, trying to respect their child's voice more, trying to negotiate more. Sometimes this negotiation is painful, it goes on forever, it exhausts parents, but they are trying. Um, the coding, get your kid on, discourse is also oppressive for parents. I think of this as requiring the parent to be a cheerleader. You know, everything tech, go for it, more of it, more of it. You know, keep, you know, give them the latest, get them into the coding club, get them into the summer camp, whatever. Um, it's also oppressive. There's no sense of when is enough. Uh, how do you balance this with anything else? Because the panic is great. There will be no jobs unless your child achieves some goal. So. There are contradictory discourses. They impose on the parent unwelcome roles. And there is very little guidance about how to navigate. But at the same time, <laughs> parents are doing all kinds of things with technology. They're finding some kind of balance which works more or well for them. Uh, and even we begin to see the policy debate catching up a little. So in the survey, we asked parents um, who use the internet, and that's about 95% of British parents. It's pretty well everybody, not quite, importantly. Um, but of, the, of those parents, five and six are using the internet in some way to support learning at home, or to support parenting, uh, including learning. So half of the parents say deliberately they use the um, technology to support their child's learning. They also use it to support their own learning. They use it to, to visit educational sites, um, download apps, and, and so forth. Yes, with some inequalities, and I'm going to come to the question of inequalities in a little while. Um, it tends to be more mothers. It tends to be more younger parents. It tends to be more middle class, but really, most parents, or many parents, in some ways have done some use of tech to support parenting and to support their child's learning. And we begin to see, <laughs> this is a headline from Wired, we begin to see that screen time debate moving forward. 
and a, a, a movement to say, um, as I think many in the academy would want, it's not about how many hours the child is online, but the question is, what are they doing? Is it good? Is it, what are they engaging with in terms of content, in terms of mode of interaction, in terms of the context in which they are using it, perhaps in terms of whether it's, it's collaborative? But still, there are all kinds of difficulties. And I think you can begin to see with these conflicting discourses and these problematic roles and these layers of uncertainty why technology is still posing a considerable problem for parents and perhaps still will. So Natasha and Jasper were another um, uh, one parent, one child uh, family. And they were a family that was, um, I, I pick partly because they were reasonably wealthy. Uh, she had a professional job. And he, like Josh, is um, 12. Actually, the boys met in the same summer camp, which is where we first met them. And they were typical of a number of the families we visited that when we knocked on the door, somebody, sometimes the parents, sometimes the child, said, oh, I'm so glad you've come. come. I want to show you my computer. I want to tell you about what we're doing with technology. I want to share the argument we're having, whatever. In this case, um, Jasper rushed to the door and opened it and uh, um, wanted to take me straight upstairs to see his latest gaming computer. And I said, no, I have to sit and just talk to your mum and we have to sign some forms about research ethics and all of this. Uh, and so, um, I came in, um, so I sat down there. And it was interesting because the, the mum was, um, she was a little um, sad, she was a little withdrawn, she was a little cautious. Uh, and one thing they told me is that the father had recently died. And so the two of them were together dealing with um, significant sadness. And the sadness was um, in a way something that, um, of course, that they shared, but also was so overwhelming that it made it very hard for them to talk about other things. And so there was a very poignant moment when Jasper said, okay, can we go upstairs now? And I said, yep, yeah, go show me your gaming computer. And the mum said, Natasha said, I don't really know what he does up there. You know, I, what, tell me what you're going to find out. And I said, well, I can't tell you anything I find out, but, you know, you can go upstairs and talk to Jasper too. And it's, it's just kind of intriguing how, you know, very real problems that families are facing can create some very serious silences between them that make it very hard uh, for the parents sometimes to share the experience. Anyway, I went upstairs with Jasper and he um, showed me his, his gaming world and he, at the age of 12, had discovered that you could make intros and outros for YouTube videos, other people's YouTube videos, and that you could get a little fame and maybe one day you could make some money from doing this. Um, and he was very excited about the, the possibility. When I went down to um, talk to um, Natasha after, she poured out that official discourse. Isn't, isn't gaming terrible? Isn't it full of violence? Isn't he, what do I do that he's on it for too many hours every day? I feel as a parent I have no control. You know, so a middle class woman, a professional woman giving a story of feeling out of control because of these powerful discourses, because of her personal circumstance, um, and because the technology is itself very uncertain. So even though Jasper was excited, I could not say to her, you know, as I might have done if he was studying mathematics or science, yes, this will be great in the future. I could not say it. Maybe, maybe I should. I don't know. I feel it's a still an unknown. She feels it's an unknown. And yet it's an investment they're making in the technology, perhaps instead of a an investment in... I don't know, languages or science or... It's hard to imagine what else a child might do spontaneously for so many hours a day and into the night, but, you know, it's worth thinking what do children want to do before? Music, maybe, I don't know. So, the technology is the source of the conflict, and we saw this in our survey as well. So, one in three parents said that the technology use the time their children spend on technology is a source of conflict. 
but only one in ten parents said that what the child does with the technology is a source of The power of that official discourse about screen time is itself occasioning conflict within the home. Um, and parents are not arguing. Maybe they, you know, once they start to focus on what the child does, it's not quite so problematic. Um, okay, I'm going to speed up a little bit because I want to leave time for questions and I've given you a sense, I think, of the project. So, um, one of the things we did in the interview was to understand the future. We asked the parents to look back, begin, and, and many of them did look back in, the, in, their, in interviews. They would spontaneously say, well, when I was a child, it was different. And of course, when a parent looks back to their childhood and then at their child's childhood, the difference they see is very often technology. And the technology comes to embody that difference. Um, and you see it here with Daisy, who says, you know, the iPad and laptop is the thing of today. When it's all integrated into our window panes, that is the thing of tomorrow. And the thing of yesterday is books and what is going to happen to books. So she tells the story of social change in terms of technological change. Even though many other things have happened in the last um, 20, 30 years, you know, we've, we've lived through austerity, we've lived through globalization and its um, rising difficulties, um, all kinds of um, uh, increasing inequality, whatever. It, technology kind of is front of mind. Um, and that sense of telling the, the, the role of the parent to, to build the continuity across the generations and take the child forward into the future is told in that way through, through technology. Just a couple of other families I want to mention to you, just to give you a sense of the diversity and the different ways. So Kyle. Kyle is 13 and he has moderate to severe autism and in the in our 73 families, we made a special effort to include children with special needs, special educational needs and disabilities. And very often what they told us was they really, really hope the technology will provide a way because they don't see another way for their child. But also for these parents, very often anything to do with the future is very difficult to imagine. And we had a number of very um, upsetting interviews in which parents actually cannot sometimes contemplate a, a future in which they are not there to care for their, for their child. So Kyle was one of those kids, and I heard this among a number of um, families with autism, where he discovered the technology. The technology was his thing. And it was going to, and, it, uh, and, and suddenly he was happy. He felt he was learning something. He had something he could kind of show that he could do. And so the parents rearranged the life around this. You know, they too hope the future is going to be technological, right? He's got to compete with the robots and he's doing it for himself. So they have um, just invested enormously. And um, I think of families like Kyle's when I hear the government say only two hours a day. I think, okay, so we're really hoping that this is a pathway for him. Do we, do we want to limit it? Wembe, uh, London is very cosmopolitan place and Wembe was a, um, uh, a, a Congo, uh, from, the, from the Congo, an asylum seeker and a filmmaker. And what we found completely fascinating was that he came first um, with uh, his um, young child, let me get this right, and the mother didn't have the money. No, sorry, first of all, the mother was um, left behind. He came first, and he got to know his child for five years through WhatsApp and Viber. He, they had a digital relationship. Then they got the money for the kids to come, and the mother was still at home, um, and the family remains held together by digital technologies. And I think this is common in many migrant and refugee homes, many dispersed families, that the technology becomes a, 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 a vital connection for the family. And at the same time, it's relevant that he was a filmmaker because um, in Britain every year we celebrate Black History Month. I don't know if this is everywhere. Celebrate, um, And the school celebrated it. This, the little girl told us. And we turned to Wembe and said, OK, so you make the films. Did you, you know, 
could you show your film? Uh, no. He had no way of letting the school know that he was a filmmaker, that he had made a film about uh, the difficulties of life in the Congo and might have shown that he could have been an inspirational speaker for the kids, but he was disconnected. He was an asylum seeker. Stay, you know. It was, it was, it was, yeah. So, um, just a little bit about class before I close. British cannot go anywhere without talking about class. <laughs> I know you live in, you know, from when we sit in Britain, we say we would love Britain to be more like the Nordic countries, please, and then we have no inequality. I know it's not quite that way. <laughs> um, but I just contrast to two families. So Lila Mohammed um, was one of the poorest families we interviewed. And Michelle and Josephine were one of the wealthiest families that we interviewed. They lived in a gated community with marble everything. And Lila lived in a place where the, which was almost a building site and, very, and the tech didn't work. And, but both families, despite their enormous differences, were investing in technology as the opportunity for their sons. Both had put them into coding clubs. So Lila's son went to the after school coding club provided for free by the school and um, Michelle and Josephine put their son in the, um, the, the fancy summer camp. Um, and you can see from the quotes that Lila, you know, here she, she's got, the, the scientist said no more than two hours, she kind of knows that. But the technology is her way of investing in the education for her child. She doesn't really speak the language very well. She doesn't really feel the world of books and libraries is open to her, but she does know that she can buy a computer and then she's kind of given her child a way to have a better life than her, even though it's very expensive for her. And the wealthy family, they are looking ahead. They know that the world of AI and smart homes is coming and they want them to be agents in this world. So their fear is that if you're not an agent in that world of tech, you become a passively used by it. Um, and then um, um, Michael said this fabulous thing, digital skills are what any gentleman should have. So classed, oh my God. <laughs> um, so yeah, so the digital opportunities are class, but so this is my note to Annette Leroux really, which is to say yes, um, of course, the families are facing enormous inequalities um, and, of course, the cultural capital that some families have allows them to build those connections with the school and with the learning sites in a way that... So Lila could not um, communicate really with her child's teachers or after-school club, whereas Josephine Thibault sat on the board of the um, fancy summer camp and had a say in how it was run. You know, cultural capital was, was, was crucial. And most of the geeky kids were middle class. On the other hand, all of them were feeling those pressures of the risk society. All of them were feeling those pressures of, you must get your child on, but you must avoid screen time. All of them in different ways, or not all, but middle class and wealthy and poor equally were finding ways to share pleasures around technology, even though they had their anxieties. And they were all uncertain. None of them were really able to say what the long-term payoff is going to be. So I heard several people ask this question around the posters this morning, and this is still the question that makes me get up in the morning. You know, how much of what I'm saying is new and different about parenting? Because parents are parenting in a digital age and with their eye for a digital future. And, um, well, the, you know, we, we make a number of arguments in the book. Perhaps the, the kind of the key thing for me is the way that for parents, the digital marks that difference between the world that they grew up in and the world their children are growing up in. And so they think through the technology, the, 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 the features of the technology, the nature of its importance in public life and in um, official discourse becomes how they think about the task of bringing up their child. At the same time, it preoccupies parenting culture. So, 
you know, these are the most fulsome, pa you know, parents are very happy to talk about technology. And what's very striking, I think, is that as they talk about technology, all their other problems come out. We hear about Danny's divorce. We hear about Natasha's bereavement. We hear about Lila's money struggles. You know, we, of course, all life is there. But you ask people about, you know, when you've got a home computer and you get that life. If you go and say, what are the, you know, difficult personal struggles of your life, perhaps it's not so easy to do the interviews. Technology becomes the kind of the, but it also um, opens up new complexities and tensions um, and um, enormous uncertainties because none of us can really say this is the way to do it. This knowledge will be valuable in 10 or 20 years. This is what, this is what has been proven to work. This is what we know from you know, past years of, of educational experience and so forth. So all those kind of anxieties and vulnerabilities. Um, become all the greater. And I will end by saying more at parenting.digital. And um, the blog is um, open. We, we blog about the work, but it's also open to other researchers. So anyone who would like to contribute as well as read is very welcome. Uh, just get in touch at parenting.digital. So much. Thank you so much, Sonia, for this inspiring presentation. I have the pl pleasure to invite Professor Roger Selye from the University of Oregon to provide his thoughts and feedback. Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, thank you very much, Sonia. I was also going to say that this was very inspiring and um, rich. And I like the way you took us, took us into these issues by uh, drawing on cases, which, you know, puts a lot of flesh around these, these uh, debates. So um, I think this is uh, socialization is about bringing up children to uh, sort of to be able to cope with the future. And we have two main institutions for doing that. One is the family and the other is the school. And in both these institutions, uh, digitization is a kind of provocation. It disrupts uh, habits that we've had for a long time. And when you have disruptions of habits and uh, provocations, people start to think and they start to imagine, as you say. And uh, uh, because we've, we've been living in a technological world way before digitization, we've had telephones and books and cars and everything, but we don't think of that as te technology anymore. We think of this thing. And your point that they, they imagine, they think about the future through technology, I think is very, is very important uh, and significant. And I think this is a way of sort of concretizing the choices that you can make and gives you something to talk about. Um, I think it's a, the provocation here is very much a double bind situation. That is, you say one thing, but at the same time you negate it. So, for instance, in this case, uh, as you mentioned, uh, this is important. Children should learn a lot of things, but screen time is a problem. And of course, this is a <laughs> this is a double bind. It's the same thing in in school. You have this. Uh, the government and, and uh, the local authorities, school authorities, make heavy investments into digital tools, especially in um, Sweden and Norway, and Finland is coming on. Uh, and and uh, at the same time, there's a public debate about the problems of this and the nuisance and the lack of control and, and the disruption of traditional pedagogical habits. So this is a kind, and also what you said, this uh, I think is, is a very psychologically very interesting thing. This notion that people are policing their children. They are looking at their screen time. So it's a kind of Gestapo role <laughs> within the family of, or, you know, living, interacting, but at the same time monitoring what your children are doing in a very special way. And I think that is a, that's an interesting thing. But this provocation then, uh, as I see it, it, it is a, uh, uh, and this worry about the future, uh, you, your, two, your geek family with Danny and Josh, uh, I saw them as the avant-garde of this uh, movement. They are 
ahead and they think they are ahead and they are trying to capitalize on this by giving their children uh, a head start you know by being on what, what is the future um i think that is that is very interesting because this is not absolutely new the idea of learning to program already in the late 70s and early 80s children learn programming in schools in sweden they learned a language called basics i don't know if basic if any one of you has has learned that but um <laughs> The thing is that the, you know, in the traditional socialization pattern, we would reproduce mainly the habits and the attitudes to life that were present in society. So the experiences of parents were relevant for the children. But in times of disruptions and, and changes, this situation is, is, is not, uh, is different. And, and uh, people worry, for instance, this notion of self-socialization that, that goes on when parents do not, um, not even in schools, do have control. We were collaborating with an American university, doing something as innocent as uh, virtual labs on, on the, uh, what happens to the sea when the, in the current climate change and so on. And the American children were not allowed to go on the internet. <laughs> so the project collapsed from the beginning because the schools were so afraid to be get into conflicts with the parents and even being, you know, prosecuted if they, or, or people raise serious complaints again. So there are all kinds of, of uh, uh, you know, attempts to harness this development and you get this double bind um, view of it. And, and of course, it's very important to talk about that, to discuss it, because it, I think it creates uh, uh, tensions. And, and at the same time, you have, as you have this public debate about screen time and so on, if you look, you had some of the national data you had, if you look at the Swedish situation, which I know, 27% uh, of all Swedish children up to 12 months are on the internet on their own now. And by the age of uh, 10 or 11, it's almost 100%. And 98% of the families are connected to the internet. And they're not 98% not, not who own a car or own a bicycle. or So it's <laughs> sort of the... Uh, the acceptance of this technology is at once, you know, when they go to their feet, as you say, is very, very uh, obvious. At the same time, this, this development is then hedged by a lot of assumptions of the dangers of it. And maybe that's why it, um, uh, we get this sort of heavy reaction. And, and, uh, but at the same time, this is not entirely new. I mean, in the, uh, already in the 1950s, American children spent between three and four hours a day watching television. And this is a, I mean, there are parallels to this, but as you also indicated, this is also to some extent a much more active engagement. You are on social media, you relate to your friends and you kind of, but, but there were worries about the children of the 1950s and they're already in the grandparent generation now. So. So they, they uh, survive. But I think this, uh, this provocation is, is uh, very interesting. And as you live through it, you worry. But uh, then sort of patterns tend to emerge. And what we are trying to do in this uh, network is to capitalize a bit on the uh, Nordic uh, tradition of uh, uh, sort of recognizing the citizenship status of children more. So, for instance, this summer I watched the debate in the French, uh, what's it called in English? As Assemblée Générale, Député de Camarade, second chamber in the French Parliament, as they decided to ban the use of um, um, digital tools, tablets, and uh, and especially mobile phones. Actually, you said the, the parents hear about the iPads and so on, but the mobile phone is now the major point of entry into these activities. And uh, at the same time as they actually, and they, they use these images of children as being, you know, totally dependent on the screen, being drugged, being almost, you know, away from this world and so on. At the same time as they did this, there was, as one of the members of this uh, Assemble Générale pointed out that, uh, maybe 20% of the members of the deputy, as they're called, were looking at their mobile phones as the discussion was going on. <laughs> so that's also a double, uh, a double bind. And the funny thing about this, and this is my point in relationship to this uh, uh, reaction of uh, controlling children of, you know, say we must, this, this cannot be allowed, we, we must have a ban on this and so on, is that the very last minute, 
somebody found out that it was not enough with the mobile phone and the iPad. We have this problem with the watches, the Apple watches. <laughs> so they were put into the package as well. And of course, it won't be long until there's another gadget which has the same function. And uh, so, so I think this is, uh, I mean, the other alternative then is to try to to use both the family and the school as, a, as, a, as um, arenas or as places for socializing children, teaching them how to uh, engage with these tools, as you said, uh, teaching them about what's dangerous, what you have to look out for, and, and uh, the other things also, um, showing them what, what use you can have of this, not just for your work, which is this very instrumental attitude, but also as a way of living and actually, it's not just technology use, but we live the digital lives. I mean, when young people and even adults spend three or four hours a day on the internet, it's not, uh, you know, it's part of their life. <laughs> it's the way you live, and it's not something that is added on to their regular lives. So it's to, to look at this problem as a problem of, um, you know, trying to prepare people for living in this kind of world. And in that case, people and the family are the two resources that we can can rely on and you can even view it as a problem of education with a capital e bildung as the germans say when you have a, you know what what will it be like to be a citizen under these uh, circumstances and and uh, what are the added skills that we need because this also has to do with participation has to do with democracy and so on if you're not reasonably well versed in these in this digital culture you're life spheres and your ability to interact and to sort of participate actually will be severely limited so so i think this was an interesting uh, image of the provocations that we feel in this uh, transition and i think it's up to us to help pe help people to assist them to articulate these worries and it's all right to be worried but the reaction must not just be that we should ban this we have to deal with it as, as a as a general uh, problem and by now most parents are fairly used to digital to I mean the internet is about 50 years now and the big change was in the middle of the 90s so the parents by now have some sort of <laughs> understanding what this is on about so thank you very much for this lively illustration of this provocative nature of this uh, new way of living and we look forward to reading your book and thank you very much <laughs>